This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon. Viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manassero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manassero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G S. Find our podcast and subscribe. Well, we have a great show for you today. Uh, this is going to be a topic we haven't really spent much time on. I mean, we talk about it all the time, but we never had a show focused on it. So I'm really excited about this. We're going to be talking about property renovation. And our guest is Van Sturgeon. Now, Van is an experienced entrepreneur who has successfully created several businesses in the real estate industry, including land acquisition, development, construction, and renovation. Van personally owns over 1,000 properties across North America and is semi-retired from day-to-day operations of his businesses. Van is also passionate about helping homeowners and real estate investors to overcome their fears of property renovations, and he loves to be actively involved in helping people reach their goals. Van has been featured in the Los Angeles Tribune, the Ritz Herald, the Hudson Weekly, Madison Graph, Lincoln Citizen, Belmont Star, Yahoo News, and Yahoo Finance. Well, Van, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Well, thank you very much for having me, Bill. It's a great pleasure. I've been looking forward to this, for, uh, to this uh, little uh, interview for uh, for a while. I I've listened to your pot a uh, number of your podcasts and some really great content you've put out there. So I'm I'm really honored for you uh, having me on your uh, on your show. Well, the pleasure is ours. You've got quite a quite a, a, a legacy here you've created, and I'm just dying to hear about it. Uh, you know, maybe if you could just uh, give us a little bit on your background, where you're from, and and how you kind of moved into this uh, area of real estate. Sure. Uh, well, I I, I was uh, I'm a product of the '60s and the '70s. Uh, I, I'm I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, my father and mother uh, were, were immigrants to to America and uh, worked their tails off to try to 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 you know help uh, pay the bills and put some money away for uh, for themselves and also for my uh, for my brother. And we lived in an apartment building in Chicago and. And as uh, every everyone's hope uh, and dream is to eventually own their own property, their their own home, my parents were were not any different, and so they scurred all their money and and with the hopes that they would eventually make a, a purchase of a of a home, but what they uh, they I don't know how, but they were able to figure out that the building that the apartment building that that we were staying at, um, actually was uh, went up for sale. And uh, the monies that they were saving for this 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 dream home of theirs, plus uh, you know, some family members helped them out putting the down payment together for this apartment building. So 
uh, they they quickly transition from not you know from being renters to actually being landlords, and uh, that happened in the in the late seventies. But Bill, you're kind of too young to remember those those dark days. Oh, back I don't in the think late so. 70s. I think I've got <laughs> I think I've got you beat on that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, back then, if you remember the, the you know the Rand hostage situation, right. uh, lining up for gas uh, gasoline because of the gas shortages, unemployment rate was crazy. Interest rates were at 18, 20 some odd percent. That was right before that time that, that those series of events occurred is when my parents had taken over this building. So you can imagine it wasn't a good time uh, getting into that, you know, into the real estate investment uh, business. And so uh, it was a struggle uh, back then. Uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s were a really difficult time. And my parents had to somehow forge forward. Um, and they encountered things like 50, 60 percent uh, vacancy rate in their building. And Ooh. we as a family had to really buckle down and cut corners and do it, everything that we could possibly to, to save money and look after this uh, this property, this investment. So from painting, the plastering, the cleaning toilets, you name it, uh, as a family, we did it and and were able to to survive the uh, survive that period of time. I remember walking through our neighborhood. Uh, there were literally the, the neighborhood would be littered with with buildings that were torched, that were burnt down to the ground uh, because uh, landlords and owners couldn't I mean, couldn't just couldn't survive because because of the, the the economy and how bad it was back then. So prostitution and all that kind of stuff moved into the area, and it was it was really a difficult period of time. So a lot of guys, with a lot of landlords, like I said, would would collect the insurance money just to just to just get out. And so we, we, we took our lumps and we worked together as a family. We, you know, we weren't the ones that would run off to Disneyland and do the vacation things. We just would buckle down and we just looked after, just try to survive. And that's the, that was the sort of the upbringing that was, that was raised up in, um, back in Chicago. Wow. Wow. Well, they, they stuck it out though. It sounds like they didn't give in. And, uh, that's right. I, I think that's one of the, the keys to success in this industry is the persistence. Right. And, uh, man, it sounds like they definitely did it through, through, you know, the rough times. I'm sure the building probably bounced back and, and, yep. uh, did, did, did some great things after that. Sure. But it took, it, 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 uh, it took a long time and, there's a lot of dark days uh, before you actually started to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. So, and then during that period of time was a skill set that I and my uh, family learned. We weren't the ones who would call up the electrician, the plumber. We would, we sat there and we kind of, you know, we had to figure it out on our own because we couldn't afford paying money to to contractors and trades. Wow. So you were actually doing like little well, work jobs there. Um, if, if they had a clogged toilet or a, a leaky sink or something like that, a leaky faucet. Absolutely. Like I, there've been times when, when I remember there was one particular instance on new year's Eve, uh, some of these, uh, there was a leak and, uh, we, as a, my father and I, we spent new year's Eve trying to figure out where that leak was cutting out a ceiling and finally figure out what the problem was. And, and patching it up so that, uh, yeah, <laughs> we had to do everything. Uh, we did everything ourselves. Yeah. Wow, that's that's awesome. That's great. Well, and and through that whole experience, you still wanted to to go into real estate, huh? <laughs> well, I, you know, it, well, I my parents didn't want anything. They they wanted like you know most parents would want their children to to turn into lawyers and doctors, and they wanted the they wanted that for myself and my brother. So. Um, I was encouraged to go off to university, which I did, and I went and I uh, I was I did quite well, and I applied to law school, and I actually got accepted to several schools, and I was contemplating doing that, but it, there was uh, I don't know I just I just loved I just loved renovating, I loved uh, real estate, I loved the whole process, and and I had a very difficult conversation with my parents because again like they they were hoping that I would move on and be that lawyer. That they that every parent wanted uh, wants and and I wasn't and I, I said to them and the, that this is the direction that I wanted to go I wanted to get into into renovations into rehabbing into construction I wanted to become a general contractor and uh, eventually they they warmed up to the idea and that's what I that's what I did so I, I back in Chicago is where I got started in 
in my general contracting, uh, I started a company and and started networking with people, started talking to people, and and I had a a huge body of experience because of you know because of being born and raised up in that business uh, um, that I had to, I, I had a full skill set, and so I I started my business and it was during a period of time where there was an upswing in real estate. It was I was uh, I sort of, I guess, lucky in that regard. And I started to, uh, I started to get work from a number of different places and the relationships that I created uh, during that time. And that's, uh, then what then eventually transpiring was I would, I would start to run into the same chaps who were in the area that I was focused on, uh, who were real estate investors who would acquire properties and then renovate them and sell them. And I would price the, the renovation out. There was also uh, real estate investors who would acquire properties, clean them up, and would rent them out. And so I started to see that, and and um, I said, "Hey, this might be something that I would be interested in doing myself." And so <laughs> that's what I ended up doing. Started. So I had my I had my general contracting business, but also at the same time I started to dabble into uh, into real estate investing in the Chicago area, huh? That is correct. That's where I got started. Now, did you start with multis or what, did you start buying single family homes first? Or? No, I started off with uh, single family homes. Um, I, I remember my first purchase was uh, just a, was a home approximately 60 years old. Uh, there was a, uh, it was an elderly couple that uh, wanted to downsize and I don't remember how I was able to find out who that, uh, how they I don't. I don't remember how that that uh, opportunity came about, but I remember negotiating with them, and I purchased that property for one hundred and twenty thousand dollars at the time. And uh, it was, there was a lot of cosmetic works that needed to be done to the to the property. I spent somewhere around thirty thousand, and eventually I, I sold it for one hundred and ninety. So, if you were to take out the the you know, carrying costs and uh, and, and sales commissions and things of that nature, I probably walked away for somewhere around thirty thousand dollars, which back then was a lot of money. The average salary was somewhere around twenty, thirty thousand dollars. For so for someone to do that over a course of uh, three months was was pretty uh, was pretty special. And so I realized uh, at that time that that was something that I wanted to continue and and, and continue to do. Wow. Well, I have a question just kind of going back a little bit. Uh, when you started working with your dad, uh, how old were you when you would go on little assignments and help out in the apartments there? <laughs> I, I'll just put it this way. I, 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 I begged and hoped that summer vacation would be over so I could go back to school. So that, was, uh, <laughs> that old man really, uh, like, again, we had to do what we had to do. So I was right, right beside him, um, helping him out, uh, especially in the summer months. From doing roofs to to window, whatever whatever it took, whatever it took, and at that time we had uh, we had to do that because we just couldn't afford paying anybody to come in and, and help us, uh, whether it's painting or electrical or plumbing, all that kind of stuff. We had to figure out on our own and do it ourselves. So I was I was right beside him doing all those uh, learning along the way. So he would learn and I would learn along with him. And of course, we made our share of uh, mistakes, but. The initial, the the drive, the passion to learn something was always there, and he had it, and it's, I guess I kind of developed it, and I also have it as well. So I, I yeah, that's what had ended up happening. Were you like in uh, grade school, or were you up in high school at that uh, around that time? Great, I was in uh, I was in high school, grade school, high school at that time. Wow, that's awesome, man! Oh man, that's uh, that's great. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, you went from this okay, having this uh, you know, getting your contractor's license and uh, and starting with your contracting business, but uh, and then you you know you bought started it looked like sounds like what we call today flipping houses, right? Where you you know bought right. a house, renovated and and sold it. Um, yeah. uh, where did you go from there? Well, eventually, I, as the general contracting business, I, was, uh, I became more and more successful, acquiring more and more clients and, and consistent business that started to grow. Um, I was also doing, uh, I was also getting involved in more and more uh, real estate investments. I would find properties and, and I would, uh, most of the time in the early days, it would just be flipping, 
I believe that was flipping property. So every several months, I would be able to turn out a product and and uh, and sell it, and and be successful at it. But both of them were continued to grow. Both sides started to grow uh, more and more, and it got to the point where I started to stretch myself awfully awfully thin because I had this ongoing successful business, but also at the same time, the lure, the 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 of, of the of flipping homes was was pretty you know was pretty strong as well. Interesting. And uh, w- when did you sort of uh, think about the buy and hold aspect of actually getting a, a rental property? When I was working for other real estate investors, I would start. I would. I would admire how they're able to put put for, put portfolios together. And there, were, there was a lot of them that were very successful. And I started to see the advantages of doing that. So it was a period of time where I slowly transitioned into into starting to do the buy and hold. And uh, I started to learn the. Uh, <laughs> Bill, I, I, I'm sure you, you, you're going to you, remember the there was no such thing as burr strategy back then, but we, right. we both of us were burring long before the burr things uh, came out. Uh, right. So that was that was essentially was um, what I was going to start to do in the early 90s, late 90s was I started transitioning into uh, building a portfolio. Wow. Wow. Um, so um, you, you're, you're moving in, you know, you're starting to move in all these different areas. Now I imagine in Chicago, a lot of older buildings too. I mean, did you have to deal with some of those hundred year old buildings and so forth, uh, with your, uh, contracting business? Oh, absolutely. There was, uh, there's many instances where, uh, you had these beautiful facades, uh, that were built in the 1910s, uh, 1910, 1920s. But uh, once you got inside the buildings, they were pretty dilapidated. So I've gotten into situations where uh, typically those types of buildings were the walk-up variety, three to four-story buildings, where the whole building had to be gutted, like actual the floors needed to be dropped. So you have to be very strategic in how you would totally renovate those, uh, rehab those types of buildings, where every other floor you would dis- you would you would rip out and and you would reconstruct. And so those are the types of products I loved. I love those types of uh, those projects uh, because it required like all the architects, interior designers, and engineers would sit there and put beautiful plans together. But ultimately, the practical aspects of applying all of that required somebody who had a you know pretty broad based knowledge base in order to be able to put that put everything together because nothing was ever accurate in comparison to the drawings to the actual building itself. So. Um, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed that process because it would allow me to problem solve. I love problem solving, and and so and that's one of the things. Those that's one of my gifts is being able to look at a situation on on the rehab renovation side and come up with uh, come up with solutions. So you had a, you did a, a all new mechanicals. I mean everything, plumbing, electrical, the whole nine oh, yes. yards. Wow. Oh wow. yes, yes, and oftentimes. And there would be situations where it probably would have been better off to 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 knock the whole building down and start from scratch. It would have been a lot uh, cheaper, but um, because of the location, because uh, th- because it's such a desirable location, and also because of historical designations, sometimes um, th- th- you couldn't do that. So in order to be able to get the building up to snuff, you had to spend more money uh, in the in the guts of the building itself and and renovating it. Yeah, well, some of those old, you know, brick or stone buildings, uh, boy, they're they're built about as solid as it can get. Uh, you know, I mean, if you, I don't think they make them that that good today. Um, yeah, you know, so if you could just do the mechanicals, you'd have an amazing building there, I would imagine. Wow. Yeah, in some situations, you could get by, you could get by uh, like that, but there's also some, you know, there there's a movement of trying to create this loft kind of space, uh, reconfigure areas, loft for bigger bedrooms because back then bedrooms were a lot smaller. So when you get into things of moving walls around, that's when you that's when you might have to rip out the actual floor, the actual structure, the floor itself, and reconstruct it to be able to support different low points in that building. And you, uh, uh, did you d- start off doing the sort of ground up, uh, actual, um, you know, from ground up uh, homes and buildings? Oh, I've, 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 I've branched off and I've also done that. I've been, I've done custom homes. I still do that. I do, 
uh, subdivisions. Um, yes, yeah, so I've, I've, I've done everything that walks and crawls uh, associated with real estate and <laughs> each of them has, uh, each of them has its, uh, demands and, and it's fun. And it's also, uh, some, there's moments where you have to, you know, you pull your hair out, but it's all great stuff. I, I love, I love real estate, everything associated with it. A lot of commercial buildings too. Yes. I, 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 on the commercial side, more on the on, re, on the condominium apartment building restoration work. Right. Uh, I can't say that I've done some office building, but more like when you look at a condominium building of 22, 27 stories, some of them usually will have balconies. When you get into climates like up in Chicago and Toronto and, uh, you know, up in the north, they take a beating. Um, and so those types of buildings usually within, the, you know, after they've been built, at the 25, 30 year mark, have to go through some some very substantial restoration work, especially if there's underground garages. So, those are the types of works that uh, that I've been involved in. I enjoy, uh, from ripping out balconies to underground garages, rehabilitating them, and also at the same time on the new construction side, like uh, subdivisions or custom homes, I enjoy as well. Um, each of them has their pros and cons. Right. Well, uh, you know, you mentioned that you own and manage over a thousand units in Michigan, Ohio, New Brunswick, and Florida. Now, that's a that's that's quite a number of, uh, of units, and uh, um, and plus they're, they're kind of spread out a little bit there. So, how did you uh, start getting into sort of out of state investing? My wife is Canadian, and so I I love Toronto, and I eventually came up to Toronto because of the family, uh, because of hers, because of her, and also because of the, I also have a lot of family on my mother's side here. So um, I came up to Toronto and I, I love, I love the city. I love the country. And it's just, uh, I, I, I saw opportunities other places in terms of making investments. So uh, to be able to get better cash flow, I'm a cash flow kind of guy. I, I've never been one to chase after appreciation. Um, I like being able to sleep all at night knowing that that X amount of dollars will come in um, per month versus, uh, you know, there's a lot of places, especially out there in the California and, and area where you're not, you know, cash flow is very difficult. In fact, it's non-existent. Oh, yeah. You got and it. And you're, you're, you're hoping and praying that, you know, that things continue to depreciate. And so uh, Toronto is in that same situation um, where there isn't much in the way of cash flow. It's a lot of uh, property appreciation. So, uh, nevertheless, I, 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 my, I have, I have family here. I've, I, I've, I spent part of my time here. But the reason why I went off into other parts was that I, I, I just chasing uh, a return on investment. I saw, I walked into the Michigan area, in particular Detroit. I saw a tremendous value there, and I started make, I started investing. Um, Ohio, in particular, Cleveland was another spot that. I started investing in because uh, because the money was there. Doing the arithmetic, the uh, numbers don't lie. So I would do the arithmetic, and ultimately I saw that there was more opportunity there than in other uh, other places. So that's what uh, that's how it sort of things evolved for me. And in each place, I would start to acquire properties using using the existing resources that are there. Uh, meaning property managers, uh, renovation companies, general contractors. And then one, eventually once I was able to scale in those particular areas, then I would assume control and bring that in-house. So I would, uh, I, would, I would have my own property management company. Then eventually I would have my own renovation company uh, within these areas. And that's how I would, things would evolve. Interesting. So you're setting up uh, these uh, different little business entities in each town that you would uh, start acquiring property in. That's uh, that's fascinating. Um, and plus, you you know, you had a, a sounds like a pretty sizable business in Chicago. Uh, was there a point though that we were you felt like you were spread kind of thin? I mean, you had all these construction construction and uh, renovation projects in Chicago, and then you, you have not only buildings and other uh, entities you're acquiring, but you're also building, you know, businesses mm -hmm. in these other areas and managing, you know, those thousand right. units. Um, uh, did you at some point just sort of, um, you know, uh, over, just oversee some of these other businesses? 
I've always been a proponent and I've, I guess, maybe lucky. I've been lucky in life in finding good individuals that I could partner up with, that I can employ. And as a result, I've, I've been able to, I'm more of a visionary, more of a, more of that type of individual who sees the opportunities and then might perhaps put the framework together, but then re- rely heavily on good qualified people to to do the day-to-day operation management of that particular business. So I've got great project managers. I've got great estimators. I've got great yeah, property managers. Uh, these are the types of individuals that at critical at critical points of a, the evolution of a business you got to bring in. There's a saying, um, I believe you can be contributed to Henry Ford, who said, I can only accomplish so much with two hands. And so that was one of those things that required me to figure out early on in my day because coming from my background, I was a I was a micromanager because that's that's what we that's what I all I knew when I in my upbringing we had to do it ourselves. We can only we're the only ones that could do it best for the least amount of money. Right, and that's where I in the beginning that's where I struggled in trying to disassociate 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 myself from the actual business itself. And then sort of, you know, uh, work on the business instead of working in the business. But early on, it was a, it was a big struggle. And that's what stunted my growth in, in, in business, whether it's on the general contracting side or in the real estate investing side, because I had to do everything myself. And I remember, I remember get, being, getting married and I couldn't go away on my honeymoon because I was so involved with, with work. Ouch. And oh yeah, <laughs> that's not oh, a yeah. good way to that start was, off. <laughs> uh, I was a type. I'm a. I am still, but sort of down the down a notch. But I'm a type A plus personality, and so if there's something that I want to accomplish, I will. If I have to sleep at a job site, and I've done, I've slept many, many times at job sites. Uh, I'll do what I've got to do in order to survive, in order to be, in order to be successful. And so that's. So that's what I was doing back in those early days. I was literally was sleeping at job sites, but I would be, I started to get stretched so thin that um, I got to a point where I almost had a nervous breakdown. I, 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 I needed help. I needed to find out, I needed to figure this whole thing out. I knew that there were uh, tremendous opportunities, but I had to figure out how to go about getting them. And Actually, at that juncture in my life, which was pretty traumatic, uh, thankfully, I was able to find a, a coach who was able to take me to the next level, who showed me what I was, uh, what the, the mistakes that I was, I was making and sort of changed the mindset of being that micromanager and adopting that, hey, maybe you should hire, maybe you need to defer. And even if though it's not 100 percent, then you can do it 100 percent. If you can get 80%, you should be happy with that. Again, just to continue the progress, just to move the ball forward. And so that was a very, thankfully, at that juncture in my life, I was able to find that individual. I paid him. I paid him to coach me. He was a successful real estate investor in Chicago who had a beautiful portfolio of properties. Um, he was fit. He was 10. He didn't have a care in the world. He was. Uh, he had his vacation home, and he would spend some of his time there and and then he would go around looking at his uh, portfolio, and I got to know him. Uh, you get to start to know people when you're in that business, and I reached out to him because I wanted to. I wanted to have what he had, and thankfully he was able to. Uh, was willing to take me under his wing and show me the way, and that's where I started to change the mindset of having to do everything myself. And it was after that that things exploded. So, sort of uh, to answer your question, I've been able to work at all these different areas and have these multiple companies just by sort of giving the vision and then finding the right people. I guess maybe I have a gift in being able to find the right people and put them in the right uh, right situations. I've, I've had people that have been with me for you know, over 20, 25 years. That's awesome. Well, it sounds like he was he's definitely a real estate investor, but he sounds like he was uh, just excellent in the area of uh, just business uh, in general, how to organize a business, how to hire good employees and how to delegate, uh, uh, which was something like you said, you weren't raised to do that. And uh, you were kind of raised to do everything yourself. I can relate to that uh, 100 um, percent. Right. But uh, that uh, that was a real smart move. And um, and it sounds like it just to made a major difference in in your businesses. Yep, absolutely. And that's one of the things that I, one of the things that I'm a huge proponent on 
for new real estate investors who want to come, want to get in and uh, see the positive benefits associated with getting involved in real estate investing. Is I, I, I attuned it to, to individuals who want to learn how to play a musical instrument. Yeah, you can grab that guitar or piano, start banging away on it. And, you know, after a couple of years, you might be able to figure out how to play a song on it eventually. But wouldn't it be much more helpful if you're able to hire hire a, a music teacher, somebody who knows how to play guitar, somebody who knows how to play that piano, sit right next to you and, you know, and help you through the process of learning how to play that particular instrument. And if you make a mistake, you know, slap you upside the head and make you repeat it and do it over again and understand why you made that mistake. And in our racket, in our business of real estate investing, if you make a, if you make a mistake, uh, see, that mistake can be awfully devastating. Uh, we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars here. We're not talking about you know, a couple hundred bucks. And so if you make the wrong decision in buying a property uh, versus uh, if you make the wrong decision in how you rehab, renovate it, these can be critical mistakes that can jeopardize and outright end any prospect of you being a successful real estate investor. So I've always encouraged people to get as much information as possible out there. Unfortunately, the problem with information, especially nowadays, is that the information that's on uh, the you know, on the internet, there's a lot of stuff that's wrong. And if you resort to watching things on television, you know, there's there's channels dedicated to you know these beautiful renovations and property investment, all that kind of good stuff that you can get done in 30 minutes, you know, duration of a TV show, but doesn't really go into depth of how you know how you how involved you need to be. And some of the things, you know, some of the critical steps that you need to take in order to make sure that your 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 investment is successful. Yeah, that's uh, that's so true. Um, you know, they, it, a lot of people go, oh, you know, look at the, those flipping homes. I could do that. Uh, no problem. You know, they're smiling. They never get dirty either. <laughs> you know, they're out there. Right. And, they, and, uh, and then when you really actually do your first, uh, you know, project, uh, you realize it's it's something uh, much different than what you just saw on, you know, HDTV or what have you. Um, yep, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And that, and that is one of the things that... Um, is, is, is unfortunate because, again, the Internet is full of misinformation and information, and it's difficult for you to be able to decipher which one is accurate or not. But, yeah, a lot of, if a lot of you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that romanticizes this. I'll just buy the property and renovate it myself. I'll grab, I'll grab a hammer, start banging away. And there's so many, situ- so many times that I've come across situations where uh, the, the, the property owner has, created, has caused more damage, more cost – for them going in to do something versus them just hiring a professional in the beginning. Um, and it's tragic, but uh, I see it all the time. I see it all the time in, in the actual individual who goes out there and purchases their first property. They don't, uh, we can do another show on how, you know, what, what are things that people should be doing? New real estate investors should be doing in purchasing their first property. Uh, I see often they just rush into that MLS start clicking away where, you know, other millions of people are looking at properties and expect that they're going to find a great deal, something that they can capitalize on. I mean, it's not there. It's not, you know, that's not the place that you should go. There's other opportunities, resources you should be tapping into to find properties. Like, Bill, I never, I know, I acquire anywhere between 100 to 300 properties in a year. And I I never go to MLS to buy, uh, to buy. I, I, I have relationships uh, within all these areas that I do business in, I've created a power team that those individuals from, you know, probate lawyers to wholesalers, bird dogs, uh, you name it. These are relationships I've created that reach out and say, hey, um, uh, there's a property for sale or, hey, there's a portfolio for sale. And, and, and those are the types of opportunities I see every single day. Well, I think that's, that's, I mean, that's awesome. And I, you know, I think, you know, I look at uh, where you are today, you know, you've got a home in Toronto, uh, one in Miami beach, you, um, you don't seem like you have to 
be as involved in your businesses as you, you know, as, as you know, when you just look at the scope of what you have a thousand units and you, and you manage those units as well. Um, but you also have enough time to actually be able to coach others. Um, and I like how you've zeroed in on the, you know, renovation side, because I think it's just overlooked by a lot of investors. They just assume, okay, you know, I'm going to buy, I mean, the big thing, I'm in multifamily, the big thing is value add deals and value add deals. Of course, you go in, you buy something under market, you upgrade it and, you know, the value goes up tremendously. You've got investors and you're able to give them a good payout and, and, you know, you're able to increase rents and the value of the property, you know, goes, goes up if you do everything right. But what do a lot of people know when they go into that? They most of them, you know, they'll go to coaches that are teaching them how to acquire properties, how to evaluate properties, uh, but they don't. They don't. There's not a module in there on on renovations <laughs> and uh, overseeing mm-hmm. contractors, and and that is to me, I think, a major need. And that's one of the reasons I was so excited about having you on. Is that um, that's where you focus? And I thought, you know, if we could just uh, spend a couple of minutes just uh, giving some some pointers there uh, as you look at a project and, and, you know, what are some of the steps involved in, uh, you know, trying to do it right? I, I, uh, there's so many times there's so there's over, over 30 years of doing this. You've sort of, I've acquired uh, a system and it's really second nature to me. And I, and the reason why I even got to the point where I want to engage uh, new real estate investors and help them through that whole rehab renovation process is because I've always been doing this for friends and family that come to me and ask me for for suggestions for help. And it, re- it happened it had happened recently where uh, a family member came oh a friend actually came and said hey can you can you sort of help us with this with this renovation that we're contemplating on our home. And so it, it, by engaging them, it, I'm right now in that semi-retirement stage of my life, I've got great people involved in my in my businesses and and um, I've sort of divested myself and sort of stop. I want to slow down and stop and smell the flowers. And in, the, in, in that interaction of helping this family member is where I sort of rejuvenated me and it gave me you know, I said, I was like, wow, this is a, this is something that I think that there's real need out there in the marketplace and allows me to be able to help people. And I'm really doing I really enjoy the process of taking helping people through this whole renovation process because there's a lot of fear associated with doing a renovation. Like uh, we have to uh, understand and appreciate that in order to be able to renovate a property. You got to decrease the value when you when you smashing walls and ripping out windows and roofs. Add it more thousands of dollars to be able to increase it past what you what you purchase for it, and so that whole process of itself is quite. You know, there's a lot of fear involved again, just because there's a lot of money, and there's also you're taking this this particular property and you're smashing it. You're you're decreasing the value in order to increase it. So what I recommend uh, when, to new real estate investors who are contemplating a property renovation, they just need to start and, and establish a goal. Like what is their actual goal? And write it down. If it's a house flip, great. How much money are you looking to derive from this house flip? If it's a property that you're looking to rent out, how much money is it that you're looking to rent it out? Once you've established those goals and you've written them down, those are the goals that you use to filter everything through whatever actions you take moving forward through the whole process and planning and execution. So if I'm looking to uh, make $30,000 on a flip, the next step is to validate that goal. Go out there and actually accumulate information to validate that, that, that goal, to make sure that there is, what is it that you need to do in order to be successful at that goal? So that would be the next step of helping people try to figure out what it is that, whether it's even possible or not. Then from there, once you've been able to validate that, you move into, you got to figure out how much money you have. And there's a whole series of things that you can do uh, that I help people out in being able to find the monies needed in order for them to do a renovation. That could be getting hard money loans that can be lines of credit that can be there's also a lot of government subsidies uh, out there as well it's a process but there is opportunities to be able to get 
some monies toward your rehab project. Once you've got that sort of figure out, you got your goals, you got your budget, you, you have an understanding of what you need, then the next step would be, you know, you got to figure out, uh, put a list together of needs and wants. Needs are things that have to be repaired on a property. If you got a window that's got a hole in it and, and it was broken window, you know, that's a window, that's something that's put under the needs category. But that shaggy green carpet in a family room, perhaps, you know, it shouldn't be listed as a need, perhaps as a want, because you could conceivably, you know, rent a property or sell a property with that shaggy green carpet. It shouldn't prevent you from being able to accomplish your goal. So those are the series of things that I walk people through. And ultimately, it, come, it, it gets in the planning section, at least, it gets to the point where you need to create a, a document called a scope of work. Now, Bill, there isn't a commercial project that I have worked on, whether it's a 27-story condominium building or a retail location. Everything on the commercial side will involve architects, engin engineers, interior designers, and they create this document called a scope of work. And I, as a contractor, would go there, refer to it, and other competing contractors would refer to it, and they would put their pricing, their quote together based on that document. Unfortunately, on the on the you know on the residential side, we don't. I, I hardly ever see that. Typically, it's just the general contractor who will jump in, and a couple of others will go to this property owner, will give them their best sense of what they think they should be done, and give them a, a give them a quote. And you can imagine that those quotes would be all over the place because they're not comparing apples with apples; they're comparing apples with bananas. And that's where on the commercial side, I encourage sort of incorporating that, bringing that into the residential side. And I help people create scopes of work. They don't have to be extremely elaborate, but they go a long way to eliminating confusion in the whole, you know, the renovation rehab process. Because you have a document that's going to specify the color of paint. You're going to have pictures there. You're going to have diagrams. You're going to have all the tools necessary to be able to minimize any discrepancies or issues with you dealing with contractors and trades and being able to deliver quality product at the end as efficiently as possible and eliminates any, any ill will that you might have with a tradesperson or a contractor. So those are the things that I encourage people to do that I don't see, a, that I don't see enough emphasis being put on out there with, with all these real estate gurus. And, and uh, if you don't follow these steps, often uh, you'll end up with uh, a disaster on your hands. And we all see the disasters in, in the TV shows that the show talk about and in, in real life. Uh, how many times have you driven through neighborhoods where you see a, a dumpster in front of a home and, and it's been there for six months and you scratch your head and you're wondering like, what the heck is going on over there? Well, it's because the whole process wasn't planned and executed properly. And that's the things that I'm really passionate about. And I enjoy engaging new real estate investors in particular and help them navigate that process. And then once they're able to navigate that, Bill, they're able to have a skill set that they can use for the rest of their real estate investing journey. Uh, they can walk into properties that are going to go up for sale in the future and be in a better position to understand what's involved in the actual you know, renovation rehab process and determine what the value is of the whole property. You can't just keep relying on home inspectors you know, at three hundred, five hundred dollars a pop to come up with a you know list of things that need to be done in the property. You got to start doing that yourself if you want to be a successful professional real estate investor. God, this is great stuff. Um, well, I'm a an out of state investor, so I you know that it's a little bit challenging for me in that I can't go to the job sites usually and trying to find good contractors. I mean, even if even if I'm working locally, which I don't, I don't even invest in California, but it is is a I mean, I've I've heard the you know I've had five hundred plus shows here, and I've heard the horror stories from people that, you know, the contractors run off with their money, or they promise one thing and they deliver something else, and it's just this long list of nightmares there that that have happened in, in some people's journeys. So you know, maybe we could look at the contractor side. Okay, you got this up to the scope of work. Now you've got to find the people to fulfill it, right? So, right. so how do you find those good contractors? Even in the confines of, of where you are, Bill, uh, you still need to go through this whole process in order to be successful, uh, to have to turn out a successful renovation or rehab. 
So what I suggest people, when you get past the point where you've created this scope of work, now the next stage would be to go tender it out, meaning you're you're reaching out to contractors' trades to price out your, your particular um, project. I always recommend the first start, uh, you should hopefully have created sort of a sphere, a sort of a, a power team uh, that, that, that has helped you along the way. Those are typically friends, family, and accountants, and, and t- people that have helped you in your journey, in your real estate investment journey. Those individuals would be the first source of you know, people that I would reach out to if I'm looking to do, you know, find out trades, to find a good electrician, a plumber, a painter. Usually, you will be able to get recommendations from those types of, from that power team that will help you in your cause, help you out. The next tier uh, would be, I'm a strong advocate of these meetup groups. I'm a strong advocate to join your local uh, REI. Uh, you, you're dealing with like-minded individuals that have, uh, some have a little bit of experience, some have a lot. And what I've always found in these in these organizations that a lot of people there that are just really want to help. They want to help each other. And so those are great places where if you get, if you need a contractor, a painter, a electrician, those are the types of places where you'd want to go to get uh, help in, in your project to be able to identify that great electrician or painter. So those are the two top sources. I don't recommend people go, especially in the beginning to run off to Craigslist and start finding painters and, and, and you know, things of that, you know, trades like that, because uh, unless you know exactly what you're doing and what to look for, it's a recipe for disaster because usually those types of individuals that uh, are the, the fly-by-nighters are the ones that frequent those types of places. So those are the top two places that I would do, uh, that I would go to get uh, help in, in identifying contractors that you may be able to do business with. Okay, so you get a list of, let's say, good contractors from people that you know have worked with them and you know have a good recommendation. Uh, uh, how do you know they're qualified? Well, uh, depending on the actual trade itself, uh, there could be that they're licensed and they should you provide you with licensing. There's going to be insurances of important component of that. Uh, a bona fide operator would have insurance and would show you and could provide you copy with that. Um Ultimately, uh, every contractor that you would like to do business with, you should they should have a body of work that they can refer you to, and then you can go visit. And upon that visit, hopefully you can find the principal, the property owner, where you can engage them in conversation and find out what was the what was the direction, like what was the how was the relationship with this contractor? Did the, did everything go well? So those are the types of things that I I would encourage people to do. At the end of the day, uh, Bill, contractors, we all are looking for that unicorn contractor. You know, the unicorn that it's just contractor that doesn't exist. The contractor that is the cheapest contractor that shows up on time. The contractor that does great, great quality work. Those three elements is what we all look for in a contractor. But unfortunately, they never exist. We all search for them. We sometimes find them and then they disappear on us. But contract, we're hoping that we can get two out of the three. And depending on the type of job that you're doing, those are the contractors that some contractors are suited for one type of project versus another project. So, for example, if I'm looking for a rental property, I'm looking for uh, that I'm looking to renovate. I'm looking for a pro- I'm looking for a contract that's going to give me speed and is going to be less expensive. Perhaps, but at the same time, if I'm looking for a contractor for my own personal home, quality would be number one, time would be number two, and then you get the picture. So you got to identify these contractors that are floating around, uh, are, what type of contractor are they, what are they best best at, and then taking those contracts and applying to your particular project, identifying who's going to perform the best out of them. Gotcha. Now, do you have uh, one-on-one interviews with those, uh, with them? Um, and how how do you know that these qualities are, are, you know, a lot of guys will say, oh, yeah, I'm quick and I'm, and, you know, mm-hmm. I'm the best price around, you know. Um, uh, how do you know that they have those qualities that you need? I think that it's important that uh, you need to, you need to go visit the actual contractor's previous work. And hopefully you'll be able to talk to the to the reference to the to the pro- property owner, um, 
that's there to, to just give, just to make sure that this individual did the work and also save time was the, the relationship there was good. Um, you got to do those things, but ultimately, in whatever choice that you you got to visit the contractor. But ultimately, how you the relationship and how you've structured it in the beginning when you enter into an agreement with that with that trades person that contractor is what dictates how things will unfold moving forward. And what that what I mean is, once you've identified a contractor, a trades person, an electrician, painter that you want to do business with. You got uh, you got to make sure that they acknowledge that the scope of work, like specifically what it is that they're doing, acknowledge that within their within the contract, have a good contract in place between you and that party, but then make sure that you've established a, a payment schedule that works best for you. I find so many problems occur when there isn't a clear defined plan of what you expect and when those that contractor should be expecting to get paid. And that's where you get a lot of turmoil. And there are situations where, oh, I've paid too much money and the contractor disappears. Or there isn't a payment schedule put together where we have where uh, the deliverables are 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 there uh, on paper that says you have to do this in order to get that, meaning get payment. And that's where a lot of this confusion occurs with contractors is that there might be it, it starts right from the get go in creating in the planning aspect of that actual renovation rehab where the scope of work is critical. It's extremely important. And then everything offshoots that. And then by virtue of having a document like that, you'd be surprised at how many fly by nighters will not be interested in quoting you because you look like you're a professional when you have a document, and you know exactly what you want. That is great, great advice. Um, now, the word I didn't hear that I was hoping to hear was uh, timetable. Now, mm-hmm. is that built into that same document? So, uh, you know, since some of these guys will say, yeah, I can do it in a month. And, and six months later, they're still working on it, like you said, with the dumpsters out front, right? Um, do you build that into this document? And I know, you know, you've got, you've got approvals, city approvals and, and, and so forth that have to have to fall into place. But do you, uh, do you, Try to develop a, a timeline. You do have at the at the point where you have agreed on a price and a contract is created, a scope of contract is part of that contract. You need to create a uh, you need to create a schedule whereby at this particular juncture, every two weeks, uh, these are the, this is the scheduling, and you work with other contractors or other trades there to be able to put a timeline together. But it should be written in that contract what your expectations are and how quickly that individual would be able to provide provide their work. It, it's it's a this is where this is the the managing side of the rehab renovation is is uh, is important because that's what I teach people is you got to literally create a a big chalkboard a virtual chalkboard and in your conversation is all these trades depending on the type of rehab you're doing. You sort of ask them these questions of how long this this going to take, and you ask that of every single trades person or contract or company that's doing work for your particular project. And then on that big old virtual blackboard, you schedule all of these people in, and you create a timeline, and you hold everybody everybody to it, and and then that's how you roll out your your renovation. Also, at the same time, it's uh, by establishing payment schedules, you'd be surprised how quickly contractors, trace people, companies will come and do their work because they want to get paid. And oftentimes, I find the biggest mistake that a lot of newbies do is that they pay too much ahead of time and they don't get enough in return. And then all of a sudden, it's the missed phone calls and they don't show up when they're supposed to show up, which adds to frustration and delay on a, on a, on a rehab project. Like, there's no... I, this whole notion that I have to give 30, 50 percent up front to a trades person to, to to reserve them to do work is 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 ridiculous. I, I I I hear and see it all the time. And as a as a contractor, I would try to get as much money as possible uh, from from a client. But at the end of the day, we have to be realistic, and all these people have to be realistic. The only place that I know of that you pay up front to get something before you get it is McDonald's. At McDonald's, you got to pay uh, you know, for your Big Mac. You got to put your money down before you actually get your hamburger. Well, none of these guys are McDonald's, and so by virtue of that, you can keep a lot of things. You can keep a lot of order and discipline in your in your rehab and your renovation project. 
That's, that's excellent here. This concludes part one of this podcast series. Stay tuned for the exciting conclusion this coming Monday. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.